verse 15 says these words. So, as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are in Rome also. Turn to your neighbor and say, neighbor, with your mask on now, say neighbor. neighbor. With God's help. God's help. And our prayers. And our prayers. This morning's text. This morning's text. Is tailored to teach us. Tailored to teach us. I'm not. I'm not. Apologizing. Apologizing. Turn to your other neighbor and say, neighbor. Neighbor. If you say amen. You say amen. He won't be long. He won't be long. Amen. I am not apologizing. Amen. Good to see brother Kenyatta here with us. He the President and leader of the Mount Vernon CID. Always good to see you, my brother here. Thank you so much. I'm not apologizing. Paul writes this letter to the church at Rome or house churches or seal cell churches who gathered in the province of the Roman Empire. This is a corresponding letter, my brothers and sisters, and it's being labeled now as a theological treatise, which contains some corrective actions throughout its total entirety. Paul seeks to give some external truth that are laded and slated and that contain some impactful words of transformation. Paul is struggling here in chapter one because he has a desire to get to Rome because his schedule of reaching those who are of the Gentile nations, he's having a problem getting there as soon as he wants to get there. Paul's circuit preaching and evangelistic teaching has stretched him to his limits because Paul doesn't have a motorboat. He doesn't have a super fast boat. He doesn't have uh, jet skis. He doesn't have a ski do. He doesn't have airplanes, helicopters. Paul has either to walk, ride a donkey, or get on a ship that is moved by the wind. However, when we look at this text, we can see that it can be comfortably couched in the convenience of stating Paul's eagerness to get to Rome, just to get Rome on his resume. Deeper investigation leads us to understand why Paul is so willing to address the citizens at Rome because it's more than just a sticker on his luggage to say that Paul has preached at Rome. See, Rome at that time was the capital city of then the known world. Its military might was unmatched. Its commerce and economy were built upon slavery. Its history of taking over weaker countries for the purposes of exploiting and exporting their resources and making them pay taxes to whomever the emperor was at that time. Even the buildings in Rome were monuments to declare their domination in the region. Everything about Rome, concerning Rome, was about power and in control. In exchange for the cooperation with Rome, Rome stood as a protector to ward off attacks for smaller colonies of people who are being attacked by those who want to take over their land. Rome was not only a protector, but it was an oppressor at the same time. Although Rome was powerful with its external work, it lacked moral and social integrity. Rome suffered from internal political struggles that led people to treat other people cruel and unfair. Corrupt leaders whose agendas were self-serving, egomaniacal, and perverted with pathetic pursuits polluted the positive possibilities and the potential for public harmony in a city called Rome. So Rome was decaying with each arrogant leader on the throne, and they even became faulty in their character as a city called Rome. With each emperor that took the throne, Done so, done so by perverted, perverted political power, crooked negotiations, or the death of their predecessor. Moral immorality were the prominent activities that consumed the daily lives of most of its leaders. Human exploitation was like a drug epidemic that was prevented, and manipulation of young people to be loyal to the powers that be became the norm of the time. The natural connection 
that women and men were to be involved in, that men were, women were forced to have affectionate relationships with other women because the men were off doing things that were unseemly acceptable in society. The Bible says in verse 24 of this first chapter, they, they dishonored them, their bodies between each other. But Paul's eagerness to preach to this sin-stained, saturated soul society helps us to understand the imperative of preaching and sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ for the moral correction of any decaying city, community, county, country, and region. Paul says the gospel of Jesus Christ will correct what's wrong in people's lives. Paul says, in essence, I'm I'm ready to preach and I'm not going to water down my message to receive, uh, for it to be received lightly from those who have to hear it. He says, I'm not going to dilute my message that it will appear trendy as the latest fashion statement. He said, I'm not going to sugarcoat my message to make it taste good with catchy phrases that make people shout, flip, sweat, fall out, and run all around the room in an emotional frenzy of expression. Paul said, that without reservation, without hesitation, without variation or procrastination, I'm ready to preach the gospel to you who are at Rome also. He declares unequivocally that he is going to do what has been outlawed for him to do. He's going to preach. Preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and not be ashamed of what the gospel stands for or what the gospel demands out of all of us. Paul says, parenthetically speaking, I am suggesting that I can find some things that I can be ashamed of. He said, I can, I can look at my own life and see how there are things that I've done like lying and bearing false witness. I can be ashamed of that. Of being depressed and being oppressive and suppressive. I can, I can be ashamed of that. He said, I can see some things like being arrogant and being a persecutor of the church and being radically against the church. He said, I'm ashamed of that. I can see myself being ashamed of being difficult to get along with, with being hard-headed, being too critical, being too greedy and selfish, and et cetera, and et cetera. He says, now, I can see myself be ashamed of all of that. But what that does not compare to the gospel of Jesus Christ, I'm not ashamed of that because that is where the power is. It is the power unto salvation. Paul says, I'm I'm not ashamed because I, I want you to understand I didn't come to impress you this morning. I didn't come to shout you and make you run. I came to let you know that there's only one power that God has given the world, and that is the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. He said, I'm not going to play with you. I'm not going to tease you. I'm not going to entertain you. I'm not going to mimic. I'm not going to pantomime. I'm not going to joke, and I'm definitely not going to compromise. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is the power of God. He says, I'm, I'm going to preach. I said, Paul, what gospel are you going to preach? Now our challenge is this, my brothers and sisters, in 2021, can we afford to teach and preach a gospel less than what Paul preached? Can we allow any other gospel besides the one that Paul preached in Rome to diminish our message in 2021? I know, I know, I know it's not easy to understand why God will allow a pandemic to show up in 2019 and then in 2021 we're just now getting on the other side of some of progress. Why does God have us in this pandemic? I don't have any theological answers. I don't have any spooky answers. I don't have really any answers at all. But what I do know that God has blessed all of us in here and those of you online to get beyond 2019, 2020, and now that we're in 2021, I come by here to tell you to stop by here and let you know I'm going to preach the gospel that Paul preached because it is where the power of God's salvation is. Here, here, here it is. Here is the gospel that Paul said he's going to preach. He said, I'm going to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ because it is not a suffering less gospel. He says, he says, Jesus was beaten, spat upon, flogged, whipped with the Roman scourge, and ridiculed. He had no royal robe, no creature comforts, no loyal following, no groupies, no entourage, but pain, agony, misery, 
oppression, depression, and suppression. He said Jesus suffered a whole lot for you and I. Jesus suffered mentally, emotionally, physically, spiritually, psychologically, socially, and he suffered immediately. I stopped by here to tell somebody that you that never believe that what you're going through, you're the only one that has been through it. Don't you know that the Savior of the world, the Christian faith, the one that which we are dependent upon, our Christian faith, our belief system is based upon the suffering of Jesus Christ. And Paul said, I stopped by here to tell you, if you're listening to somebody who keeps telling you that if you're a Christian, you're not going to suffer, the, le the devil is a liar. They have lied to you because God said, we have a high priest that is in connective of everything we go through and everything that you're dealing with Jesus has already dealt with so don't you fool yourself in thinking that God does not like for you to suffer he does like for you to suffer you know why because just like he let Jesus suffer he lets us suffer so we can stop being arrogant about who we are and learn how to lean and depend on the Lord he, David said it was good for me that I was afflicted and sometimes we have to go through stuff in order for us to understand how God is working in our lives don't you know if everything was hunky dory and everything felt good all the time and we never got old and we never got tired and we never got sick most of us you couldn't speak to on Sunday morning our nose would be so stuck up in the air, we would be so haughty and high mighty that we don't think that anybody else deserves to be even spoken to on Sunday morning. But all you got to do is spend a few hours in the hospital, spend a, spend a few hours at the funeral home, and you realize that everything you're going through, God has blessed you, and there's no reason for you to be arrogant about anything. Paul says, Paul says I'm not going to preach the gospel of a suffering less message. Secondly, Paul says, I I'm here to preach a gospel. I'm not going to preach a gospel that is not a cross-less message. His gospel contained the birth, the miracles, his presence, his personhood, but also an old rugged cross. We cannot get by carrying our cross. Uh, you do remember Jesus, he said, um, uh, if you're going to follow me, you're going to have to pick up your own cross and follow me. Uh, 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 I have yet, Brother Keith, had what is called a custom-made suit, where um, those of you who don't know what a custom-made suit is, it means that the tailor takes time to measure every aspect of your body to make sure that they, when they make your suit, it fits you better than a suit that you bought off the rack. A custom-made suit is fitted to fit you like it has never going to fit anybody else. You're missing your shout crew. I need, I need to help you one more time. God has fashioned your cross for you to carry and can't nobody else carry it. Uh, 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 uh. If Jesus carried the weight of the world's sins on his shoulders, if God put that on him, you can't even imagine what your sin weighs. And if you're whining and complaining about the stuff that you have to carry, always reflect on that old rugged, rugged cross and realize that everything that you did in the past, everything you're doing right now, and everything you're going to do on tomorrow going forward, Jesus has already carried that sin on the cross. We don't like to talk about sin unless we're pointing fingers at other people. But I heard Paul over in the third chapter of Romans uh, round about the 23rd sermon, sermon I mean it's a verse he says all have sinned and come short uh, I didn't say y'all I said all all means that all of us have some room of improvement and all of us have to carry our cross with such diligence with such pride with such humility that we are not complaining about what God has put on us we're thanking God for the grace to carry whatever it is that God has given us says, I'm not going to preach a sufferless gospel. I'm not going to preach a crossless gospel. But he also says, I'm not going to preach a, a gospel that's bloodless either. See, the gospel that Paul preached was a bloody message. For without the shedding of blood, 
There is no remission of sin. There is no forgiveness of our sin. Jesus shed his blood from his hands, from his head, from his side, and from his feet. Uh, 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 he died by shedding his blood. Now, I don't know. I've never been a mother, so I've never birthed a child. But I've been around enough mothers in my life and been around my own mother. They tell me there is nothing like the love of a mother has for her child. Because a mother has to carry the baby for nine months, three tribes, mesters, and Mama has to go through birthing pains and uncomfortability, have to sleep on her side sometimes, have to sleep with her feet elevated, have to sleep sitting on her back, can't never sleep on her stomach for the next nine months because she don't want to hurt the baby. Mama has to go through some uncomfortable times in those nine months. I ought to have some amen in here from some mother. I may not, I may not share your burden or your experience, but I do have some eyewitness accounts. 